Have you ever made a really bad decision? I mean, one of those decisions where if you could go back and do it all over again, this time things would be different. Knowing what you know now and what you didn't know then. Well, today's lesson's about a tune. It's about being attuned uh, tuning our hearts into God's will for our life. And, and I have to admit, over the weekend, I kept thinking of this title, a tune, a tune, and all I could think was Gesundheit. And, uh, but it, it's really more than that. You know, we all make decisions. Uh, we have graduates that we're going to celebrate tonight, we're going to honor today. today and, and they're about to start in a new part of their life where they're going to make a lot of decisions for themselves. Parents are going to knock the training wheels off and they're going to get to go uh, spread their wings and make decisions. And as all of us do, we will make millions of decisions this year. Just this morning, uh, I, w- I was making a decision. Should I open my eyes now? No. Should I open my eyes now? Should I open my eyes now? No. The alarm goes off. Can I, can I hit the pause button without opening my eyes? No. We make silly decisions. And sometimes we make big decisions. And when we make decisions like, should I change jobs? Or should I keep the one I have? Or should I change careers? Maybe I'd be better at something else. Should I continue to live in Chattanooga? Or should I move to another city? Or should I stay in the house that I'm in? Or should I move to another house? Should I get more education? Or should I get specific training? Bigger decisions than that really are, who will I allow to influence my life? Who will I allow to speak their wisdom into me? And the truth is is that most of these questions, if not all of these questions, really don't have a scripturally right or wrong answer. Really, the majority of the decisions that we make are decisions where we're choosing best over better over good. It's not right and wrong, but most of the decisions we make are best over better over good. Most decisions in life are not choices between right or wrong. They're not scriptural choices, but between wise and unwise. Now, before I go any further, I do want to say this. One fatal flaw we make when we're making decisions and we're choosing between Uh, best, better, and good, or wise and unwise, Uh, sometimes we'll see the situation and we'll say, well, if it's not wrong, then it must be right. And, And there are many people who would tell you, because they've traveled down that road before, that sometimes if something is not wrong, going ahead and doing it may still have disastrous consequences. The Bible says much about wisdom, about choosing wise over unwise. Now, in in airplanes today, we have something they call a flight recorder, and I don't know if you're familiar with the flight recorder or not, but uh, they call it the black box, but the truth is it's not even black, it's orange, so that they can find it uh, more easily. But there's this flight recorder in every flight, and what it does is, is that on, on a very rapid basis, there are 88 different things that it's monitoring on the, the flight. It's monitoring airplane performance. It's monitoring the performance of the pilot. It's monitoring the wear and tear of the vehicle you're riding in. All those things are being monitored constantly by this device, this orange box, if you will. And, and, and the interesting thing about it is most people only hear about the orange box, the flight recorder, the black box. They only hear about that after there's a crash and they bring it in to decide what caused the crash. But the truth is, is that this is constantly being monitored and they use this flight recorder not just to discern what happened after a crash, but to see what's going on before the crash so that they can avoid the crash. And I tell you all that to say this, the way God operates in our life is that he operates after the crash. We talk about that a lot. And we're very familiar with the verse that we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin are death. We've read all those things and and how how we were saved after our crash. But God also works before that crash, before you get in those situations where you're down the road like Bruce Almighty was, and he's sending those signs, sending those signs, and you're just not tuned into him, and the crash happens. 
This morning, I want to talk about the God who is on both sides of the crash. The God to whom we attune our hearts to his will in, in our lives. Um, so how do we make good decisions? I guess that's the, the question is, what do we do? How do we go about making good decisions? And some people would tell you that making a good decision has something to do with wisdom. And I would tell you that making a good decision has everything to do with wisdom. It's all about being wise in what's going on around you and seeking the wisdom of God because the wisdom of God often can help us make great decisions. So where do we find that? Well, the book of Proverbs is the wisdom book. There are many wisdom books in, in Scripture, but the book of Proverbs, the wise sayings of Solomon, uh, seem to have a way of speaking into our hearts uh, with wisdom in ways that, that no one other than Jesus Christ himself can do. And this morning, I want to look in the book of Proverbs and talk about how we can attune our hearts to God and what it means to be wise and to have wisdom. So if you will, uh, the very first chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we're going to read the first five verses. Solomon wrote this. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern, to discern sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. That all sounds like a good thing, doesn't it? And then to give prudence to the naive and to the youth, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will acquire wise counsel. He's saying, to my sons, I want to leave wisdom. It'll change your life. It's indispensable in the millions of decisions that we make. You know, in this particular case, Solomon only, uh, comes up with two synonyms for wisdom. Because if we're going to define wisdom, we want to know what it is and how we make a good decision. He says, here's two synonyms that tell us what wisdom is. Wisdom is made up of two basic components. One is discernment, and the other is prudence. There's two things that are involved in everything that has to do with wisdom. One is discernment, and you'll find that in verse 2. And prudence, you'll find in verses 3 and 4. Well, let's start with them, kind of define them. We're going to do some definition, then we're going to apply this lesson. First, discernment. The Hebrew word for discernment really means the ability to notice subtleties and distinctions. For instance, discernment. Um, you're having a conversation with someone, and they make this statement. I did not say you stole the book. Now, if they said, I did not say you stole the book, that would mean that they didn't say it, but somebody did. Or I did not say you stole the book, meaning they never verbalized it, but they really did think it. Or I didn't say you stole the book, which means somebody stole the book, but I don't think it was you. Or I didn't say you stole the book, which means I don't think you took the book, but you probably took everything else, my shirt included. All of those things are little subtleties, inflection of voice, uh, eye contact, uh, body language. Those are little subtleties that have to do with conversation. Sometimes we notice other subtleties in, in what's going on around us, and we can see things and think, oh, okay, there's, there's something different about that situation. People who have this gift of discernment, they'll read a book, and they'll start doing the character development in the book, and they'll notice things about the character that we may not pick up on. It's the ability to see, uh, to read things in the white spots between the ink stains. It's discernment. It's something that within all of us we can develop. And then on the other side of that, there's prudence. Prudence is really a Hebrew word that really means practical, strategic planning. It's taking this um, uh, discernment and it's applying it. It's being able to see the things that are going on around you, paying very close attention to the subtleties and the distinctions that are happening. And, and then it's saying, okay, if we go down this path, prudence tells me, this is where we'll end up. Happens to me all the time in, in, in my job as a minister. You know, a, after 20 bazillion years of doing this and seeing people and watching what goes on in folks' lives, sometimes I can see certain things and think, okay, that's where that's 
headed. And when it ends up there, these people will come, they'll tell me about it, and they'll say, this is what's going on, and I'll say, well, okay, then did you do this or did you do this? And they'll say, how did you know that? Well, I'm not smart. It's just that I've seen it so many times. That's prudence. So, so wisdom's really made up of those two things. It's, it, it's made up of, of this discernment, this ability to see the subtleties and distinction of things going around us. And it's also prudence, the ability of seeing those things and knowing where they head. It's not just insight. It's insight with foresight. That's what wisdom really, really is. It also has to do with reality. And uh, there's a... a theologian by the name of Gerhard von Rod, and he made this statement about wisdom. It says, wisdom is confidence, and it's living your life with confidence. Wisdom is confidence, confidence with regard to the realities of life. Wise people have their lives and live their lives based in a finite reality of the things that are going on around them. Um, wisdom is making decisions based on the way things really are, not the way we imagine them to be, or not the way culture tells us they are. And the only way that we can make that, dis that, that distinction is by growing in discernment and growing in prudence, the two components that make up wisdom. Well, if wisdom is reality and competence based in reality, how do we get out of touch with reality? What, what happens in the life of an, an ordinary average person that can get them out of touch with the wisdom that uh, should be a part of our lives and the reality that we should be living in? Where does that happen? How does that happen? And, and I want us to go back to um, Proverbs 1 and look at the last two verses in the passage. It says, uh, verse 32 and 33, For the waywardness of the naive will kill them. And the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. Basically here he says there's two kinds of people. There are naive people and there are foolish people. We lose touch with reality of God when we can be categorized as either naive or foolish. Now, we all have in our mind what naive really means, don't we? I mean, we, we kind of know people who are naive. But when you get to the definition in Hebrew of this word that's used for naive, it, it really colors it in a different light. Because this particular word simply means the uninformed emotionally or the spiritually un ungrounded. That these are people that are emotionally unformed or spiritually ungrounded people they're naive basically what it says is that these are people who can't think for themselves you ever met anybody like that someone that you know everyone around them influences them but they really just can't think for themselves and the truth is is that all of their decisions based cultural are based on cultural momentum they're based on what all the voices around them are telling them and the problem with that is that we live in a society that cultural momentum is, is traveling so quickly that what was right yesterday is wrong today. Culture consistently, continually changes. And so naive people can't keep up with what's going on around them. They lose discernment. They lose prudence because they just can't think for themselves. They let everybody else in the world influence them rather than looking for the source of reality uh, through God. You know, we see it happening in our society right now. And, and I don't want to get too deep into this, but you know, last year I knew that I used the restroom in the men's room. This year, we put people on the moon. Now we can't find a bathroom. And when our lives are based in cultural reality, that makes us naive. That means that everybody else in the world can influence us. Flip side of that is foolish. Now, the Hebrew word for foolish here is, is insulting, to be honest. Because the Hebrew word for foolish actually means this. It means someone who is really, really wise in their own eyes. 
These are the people who are arrogant, who are prideful, who always believe they're right. And, and let me have a caveat to that. I think everybody always believes they're right because if they didn't, they would change and they'd be right. But this is different. This is someone who always thinks they're the smartest guy in the room or the smartest girl in the room and that no one can ever tell them anything because they already know everything. And, and what this does is it, it breeds self-righteousness. It, it breed, breeds opinionated people. And the worst thing of this is that it breeds a group of people who despise correction. Now, I know this because I have been foolish. I know this because I've experienced what it's like to be that kind of person. Arrogant, pride, prideful, uh, overbearing, unteachable. I've been all that. And I can tell you, those people are the most miserable people in the room. And the one thing that I've learned that after all these years of teaching people, and basically that's what I do, I teach people, but I don't give you a test. Life gives you the test. And I teach people, I don't give you a grade. Life gives you the grade. God gives you the grade. But after all these years of teaching people, the one thing I've found is that someone who knows everything can be taught nothing. And that's a foolish person. Because what you've got here is you've got two people who are out of touch with reality. One is out of touch with the reality because they let everybody else influence what's going on around them. The other person is out of touch with reality because they allow no one, including God, to influence them. And so we've got people, we say wisdom really is discernment and prudence. And the people who are out of touch with that reality that gives us competence in life are naive people and foolish people. Well, so how do, we, how do we avoid being in these categories? Where, where can we get to the point where we're somewhere between naive and foolish, where we are cultivating discernment and prudence in our lives? And that's where Solomon is very specific with his sons. In Proverbs 1, 7, the very first part of the, the verse, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Now I'm going to let that soak for just a minute. Because fear is one of those words that in our vernacular is a negative thing. We don't want to be afraid. You're not supposed to be afraid. As a matter of fact, Phil, put up that next passage, 1 John 4, 18. We've read this passage time and again. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and uh, the one who fears is not perfected in love. You're saying, well, wait a minute. You're telling me the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and then you're telling me that there's no fear in love. Well, what's the deal here? Well, there's good fear and there's bad fear, and that's what I want to talk about for just a minute. Fearing God in the proper perspective is the beginning of discernment and is the beginning of prudence. But let's talk about negative fear first. Usually negative fear is something where people are afraid of someone or something because it is going to harm them, which is an emotional thing, or is going to hurt them, which is a physical thing. It's a betrayal of trust, really. It's, it's to say that uh, I'll just... Take Jim, for instance. Uh, let's say I'm afraid of Jim. Uh, Jim's bigger than me, and he probably could pound me in the ground with one swing. But uh, in order for him to do that, I would have to not trust that he would not harm me. And it's a betrayal of, of trust. And, and so uh, w when we get to that point, that's negative fear. That's being afraid because someone's going to emotionally har harm us or physically hurt us. And, and so when you look at 1 John 4, in that light, it's like, you can trust God. He has your best interest at heart. He's not going to emotionally harm you. He's not going to physically hurt you. He, he's going to lead you. He's going to guide you, and he's going to allow you in circumstances that can cause you to grow, but he will not destroy you. But when we get to the other side, we find out that good fear is something much different. That good fear involves experiencing something so amazing, so awesome, so precious that we feel a responsibility to steward it well. It's being in the presence of something so amazing, so awesome, so precious. I don't use the word precious a lot, but you know what I'm talking about, that we feel like we should steward it well. A while back, uh, I did a sermon 
and, and it was it was really about the health of the church the the signs that a church is healthy and I call it the Epgar score of the church and and I, and I started the sermon with a story which Epgar, if you don't know what an Epgar score is, it's a, it's a score they give children when they're born as to how healthy they are right at that moment. And we had a story in our congregation of a couple who had had a child, and the Epgar scores were really low. It wasn't looking good, and, and it was amazing what God did in that situation and in their lives. And, and the way I intended to begin the lesson was I was going to hold this child. It's naked Haley Hughes' daughter Ruby. I was going to hold her and talk about this story. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that the day before, I'd gone tubing down the Nantahala with our college kids, and I'd hit my neck on a rock after I got twisted around. I could not feel my left hand, and I could not feel the fingers in my right hand while I was preaching that day. And so I told Nick, just, you just bring her up and hold her, and he did. And, and you're thinking, well, why are you telling me? Because I was afraid to hold the child. Now, was I afraid of the child? No, I'm not afraid of a baby. Baby's crying, don't bother me. Uh, was I afraid of Nick? The hipsters might think he's tough, but he's just a guy to me. Uh, I, I'm sure he would fight to the death for his child, but I don't think Nick would ever harm me, okay? Uh, here's what I was afraid of. That child was precious, and I wanted to steward her well. See, that's, that's what Isaiah was talking about in Isaiah 6, where he's called in the throne room of God during the reign of King Isaiah, and he sees God on his throne in flowing robes, and he sees the seraphim standing before him, and they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This, it, it, all glory on earth and in heaven are given to him. And then we read in Isaiah 6, 5, these words, as he, he's brought to his knees before this God in fear. And it says, then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips, and and live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts he come in contact with something so awesome he come in contact with something so amazing and so precious that there was fear not that he would be harmed but that he wanted to steward that experience well, well, fearing God is, is really getting to the point where we know that we're in the presence of someone that we cannot manage, that we're in the presence of someone we cannot manipulate, we're in the presence of someone we cannot control, and we are in the presence of someone we cannot intimidate. But I also want to tell you the best part of this fear when we fear God. We'll gain discernment, we'll gain prudence when we understand that just as amazed and in awe and as precious as we think God is, that we're not just at his mercy. We are part of his plan. That this awesome God who spoke a world into existence has a plan for your life and my life. This awesome God, who made all that we know and will destroy it faster than we can tell about it, knows everything about you and loves you anyway. And to me, that's pretty amazing. So let's examine the crash site. Let's go back to our own flight recorders and let's talk about that for just a minute. I want to ask you some questions from your own flight recorder. And when you answer these questions in your mind, there's nobody going to be raising their hands or anything. I want you to look at it with a different view. Not this view of guilt or duty, but the view knowing that you're the child of an amazing God. In your flight recorder, is your heart attuned to God right now? Or has it drifted? Do you have a high regard for knowing God's will through his word? Or have you just gotten caught up with busyness in life? Do you gather with the people of God regularly to celebrate God? Or are you just kind of hit or miss? Do you, do you pray often? And, and thank God regularly for the way he's blessed you. And, and how are you stewarding your relationship with God is it something that you 
give priority or is it something that you take for granted? Now, these are all things that are part of our flight recorder that if we answer these questions, we're kind of going to know where we are. And if we'll monitor these things, it may help us avoid a crash. But I have to admit, I read these questions and I think about my answers and I'm really not much different from you. Truth is, I come up on the bad side of these things just as much as the good. And the reality is, is I don't even want to answer these questions most of the time because I have been so rooted in a religion of guilt. A religion of a God who can't possibly love someone like me because I don't do the right things or say the right things and sometimes I do the wrong things. And I want you to see that differently. And I guess wisdom really is seeing that differently. It begins with being in wonder of God and yet acting with great stewardship of that relationship. And I just want you to know that the way we break out of this pattern of guilt, because God's guilt and shame are not from God, into a pattern of joy in seeking His wisdom, there's only one place to start. The place to attune our hearts to God, the place to begin this attuning our hearts to God and embrace fearing Him, is at the cross. Jesus said a lot of things in the New Testament in his time here. He said that we're to love our neighbors ourselves. He said that we're to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said that we should pray for those who persecute us and that we are to love our enemies. I want you to think about that. Love your neighbor. Pray for people that persecute you. Love your enemies. Now, he told us, all of us, to do that. But I have to ask you this question. Do you think he would tell us to do that if he didn't do it first? Do you think he would tell us to love our enemies and love people who persecute us if he hadn't done it first? And when we feel this guilt and we know all the ways that we've fallen short, do you not realize that before you even knew who he was, he loved you? And when you came in contact with who he is and knew that your life wasn't in tune with his and your heart wasn't attuned to God, he still loved you? See, Romans 5, verse 6, and then verse 8 tell us this. For while we were still helpless... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. As we look at the cross, we find that the beginning of wisdom is recognizing what we couldn't control. Recognizing what we couldn't help. I mean, think about what happened there. Could you have come up with that plan? Something that God had foreordained, foreordained before the beginning of the world, could you have even thought of that plan in order to build the bridge between God and man? And we stand before that kind of love. And we stand before that kind of grace. And we know this about it. That's not love that I can manipulate. That is not grace that I could have managed. There's nothing that happened on that cross that I could have controlled. And to be honest, even still, the magnitude of what happened there, I don't fully understand it, and I'm not sure I can explain it. And so when we stand before something like that, the beginning of wisdom is knowing this. To being tuned in on what happened there and just trying to understand what we can wrap our minds around, we know there's so much we couldn't control, and so there's only two possible things we can do with that. We can choose wisdom, or we can choose naivete and foolishness. Because when we look at the cross, we either can run from it, or we embrace it. We can't control it. And we can't manipulate it. 
But we can embrace the grace of the cross. And that's where wisdom begins. My question for you today is this. Which one are you going to do? When you look at the cross and you seek the wisdom of God, are you going to run from it? Or will you embrace it and live for it?